Hello, everyone, and welcome to CAK's Back to School webinar. We are so happy you all were able to join us today. We have lots of folks here who can tell us everything that we kind of know about our planning to go back to school. First off, I am Julia Johnson, CAK's Director of Communications. We also have Neil Peters. He's on our Board of Directors, and he's also with DPM Service Care which will tell us all about cleaning and sanitation and all that stuff that's going on at CAK. And then we have Dr. Lynn Nichols, pulmonologist in Knoxville, also on our board of directors as well. And a lot of you know Janet McLean, retired CAK teacher, who is also on our board of directors. Mr. Rich Fulford is here, our head of school. And we also have student Anna Nichols, who was nice enough to join us today, a senior at CAK going to tell us all about, you know, back to school and, and everything that we're going to be doing. I know a lot of folks have questions, but before we dive into all of that, I actually would like to turn it over to Mr. Fulford to open us in prayer. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everybody who's joined us tonight. If you would, we believe in the power of corporate prayer. So if you would join us in prayer, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this evening. Father, I just thank you for your, your Holy Spirit's guidance. Lord, as we as we have a discussion today about reopening our school, Father, I pray we'll have clarity for all those who are in attendance, Lord. And I just pray that we are uh, just have a good dialogue. Father, I pray that your Holy Spirit will guide us with discernment, with wisdom. May our eyes, my, our ears, our hearts, our minds be open to what you have to tell us and what you have for us to share, Lord. Ultimately, let us glorify you with all that we say and do. Father, our main goal is to keep people safe, keep our children healthy, and keep us in school, Father. But even, even before that, is to win souls for Christ and make disciples of all nations. May we do that. Father, never before has Christian education been any more important in this country than right now. And Lord, we just want to do that and do it to the best of our ability. Allow us to do that. Allow us to communicate Christ's love to families and make a big difference and a change, not only in the CAK community uh, for Christ, but let us make an impact throughout our, throughout our entire community, through our state, our nation, and the world. Uh, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, make disciples of all nations. And we pray for that in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 As we were making our back to school plans, of course, the very first people that we wanted to talk to you about these plans are the experts in the field, and that's our educators. So to open us up, I really want to talk to Janet McLean and ask you, Janet, about the importance of face-to-face -face learning and you know the difference that that makes because we really wanted to make that a priority if at all possible for safety reasons so as a teacher as a former teacher can you tell us why that is so important to have face-to-face -face interaction well any face-to-face -face interaction is is huge i mean face to face with our children our own personal children with our spouses but in, in our classroom is most important because you can have eye contact with them they uh, can see, they see your face, and some children are not auditory learners, so they need to see as well. Uh, even children that have hearing problems, they need to be able to, to see your face, be able to see your mouth move. Uh, and as, with your face, you can uh, show expression, they can see so many things, but they need our presence, just the presence in the room, and the important for me to start a year off that way you got to get to know your children you they you need to know them uh to know them by name to know a little something about them uh to to teach them first now if if that cannot happen if, if the time comes where that cannot happen i just want to to say that i don't know that anybody did it better than cak for for the virtual learning or distant learning, remote learning. Uh, I personally, my hat goes off to them. I could not have done what they did. It's hard work. And uh, all the snags and the glitches, I think they've gotten out of it. They're ready, you know, they'll know exactly what they're doing, no doubt. Uh, and I have all the confidence in that. And I've, I've seen them actually in action and they're to be commended. But face to face in the classroom, there's nothing better. Uh, the touch of, of a child, even a hug, if that's possible, those are the things that, uh, that are the best thing about being in the classroom. Just your very presence with children. 
Definitely. Yeah, the presence is so very important. And, you know, Rich is not only our head of school, but also, you know, educator, been in the field for a long time. And so Rich really made that a priority that, that if at all possible, we want to be in the classroom and we want to be in person, but we consulted with medical experts as well. And we are so thankful to have Dr. Nichols on our board of directors. So Dr. Nichols, can you tell us a little bit about this COVID-19 and transmissions and you know what you're seeing in the medical field as far as COVID-19 is concerned? All right, well, uh, you know, in Knoxville, everyone's aware right now that we've had an increase in the caseload um, and uh, the intensive care units are reflecting that. It's not just an increase in numbers from testing. It is more people are really sick. Um, and uh, I think just in the past 48 hours, I've talked to so many uh, friends and acquaintances now who are, it's getting closer and closer to home, people having to quarantine, uh, family gatherings where one person gets sick and then the other people might have a milder illness or have to stay away from work. So it is starting to hit us here in Knoxville. Um, fortunately, it's nothing like what went on in New York. Uh, we, you know, the hospital situation is uh, much better. Um, the uh, elderly and uh, the folks who uh, could be affected, you know, more seriously by COVID, I think, are really taking it to heart. Whereas, you know, in that first wave, when it came to New York, people didn't know who needed to avoid or, or, or what. Um, so I think that people in Knoxville are doing a, a really good job um, of following all of the different recommendations. Now, are we perfect? No, we're not. Um, and, you know, lots of people have senses of invincibility and maybe that's younger people or healthy people. And so they're getting on board. Um, I am seeing at the restaurants, uh, in our clinics, um, at the stores that definitely, uh, the older people are wearing masks. They're, uh, hand sanitizing, being more careful. Uh, I know a lot of people are just staying at home and letting their their uh, children and grandchildren bring them food and, until this passes, and this will pass. It's a virus. We've had lots of viruses. We've had tuberculosis. We've had lots of things over the, you know, millennia, um, and so people are rising to the occasion. Um, uh, I'm really confident. Last night, we had a board meeting where the return to school plan was discussed and many questions answered, many good questions. And it's just a well thought out plan. Um, it's, it, we're never, it's never gonna be perfect, you know? It's a plan to reduce the risk of people getting sick or taking the virus home from school as much as possible. Um, so I encourage everyone, if you haven't, to please go back to the email from last Friday and listen to Rich's six-minute talk. It's a great summary. It's a great encouragement of why CIK is doing what it's doing. But then also read the attachments just to see the specifics. And then also know that, wow, this sounds different. Well, it's really what the other schools in town you know, other private Christian schools. I can't speak for Knox County, but I've reviewed some of the other schools. It's what they're doing too. And it's what the Knox County Health Department is recommending, the state. We're in, we're in line with CDC and our leadership is really uh, doing and has done and will continue to do a good job. And one of the main things is this, is in this situation is we have to have a lot of grace for leadership. Um, one of the best quotes I heard in the last six months was, if I, if I said something two months ago, please don't quote me <laughs> because it's an evolving situation. And as we get more information, we're going to go back and say, you know, that thing I said two months ago, ignore it. Now, this is what we know. Um, one thing that I would say um, is I'd like to encourage everyone. We have a great plan at CAK that our administration and teachers have put together um, and read the details. But just like everything else at CAK, you know, we are a covenant school when it comes to our children's, you know, uh, faith in Christ. We covenant with the parents. We're not everything. And this is a similar thing where it can't just stop at the door because the fewer students and staff that come in carrying the virus, 
the fewer people that are going to get infected. So I really want to encourage everybody for it to be a 24-7 until this passes. I pray it passes in, you know, a few months. But I really, you know, if we keep up what we're doing at school at home, and it's not just about masks. I mean, people, we've made a lot of masks. It's about all of the things together. Um, and I compare the mass to, be, in my lifetime, uh, when I started driving, it wasn't mandatory to wear, wear a seatbelt. And then when they passed the law, you know, we were like, oh, it's not manly to wear a seatbelt. So only, you know, women are going to wear seatbelts. I'm going to be manly. Well, then they passed the law, and now you put your seatbelt on, and you don't think about it. But just putting a seatbelt on or just putting a mask on doesn't prevent the problem. It's all the other stuff that goes with it. You know, if we're talking about the car analogy being a safe driver, following the rules, you know, taking care of your car. So it's the whole package of looking out for others with, you know, and everybody's heard all of the steps by now, the social distancing and the hand washing, sanitizing, uh, smaller groups, um, not intermingling indoors with a, a lot of different uh, big groups. So don't want to harp on that too much, but I do want to say that I think we have a great plan. And from what Janet was talking about, it, it, the plan is to start in person. The teachers and the students uh, can get to know one another. And when, if or when we need to go home and le learn from a distance for a week or two, they'll know each other and then we'll come back together. And I like to say it may not be for COVID, it might be for a blizzard, it might be for flu. Or we've had all types of things in the last two years with floods and tornadoes. We're not going to have those big pauses in learning anymore. So I think it's not just a good plan. I mean, never waste a crisis. This crisis is going to teach us how to handle a lot of different things going forward. And we won't get as many ski trips, unfortunately. But anyway. Yeah, yeah. A blizzard in East Tennessee. I think that would be... <laughs> We haven't had that since then. It used, it used to happen. <laughs> it did. It did. You're right. You're right. Well, we've talked a lot about, you know, the teacher aspect and the medical aspect, but another area that a lot of folks have asked many, many questions about, the cleaning and the sanitizing. So we have Neil here to let us know a little bit more about the pathogen cleaning and he has some expertise in that. So I know you've spoken a lot with Michael Westover, who is our director of facilities. Um, a lot of this stuff goes over my head, but um, I've, I've heard it in passing, so I'm hoping to learn a little bit about this from you as well. So if you can kind of speak about what you have learned and done and worked with Michael on. Sure. Uh, first of all, Michael, he takes it very, very seriously, along with the entire facilities team. And what we've done, uh, we've started with looking at the protocols in place. Uh, by the CDC and, and the EPA for, for disinfection. And, and one thing we've looked at is, and, and I'll go ahead and look at this as an education, you have to properly disinfect, you have to clean the surface. So when you start with it, there's a lot of people that go out and spray sanitizers or disinfectants and they, they think that's actually disinfecting. We actually have a meter, uh, it's called an ATP meter, where we can come in and swab a surface and it will tell us what kind of not what kind, but how much microbial life is on that surface. So it'll show bacteria, it'll read mold, mildew. It actually will not read viruses. That's where you've got to go back and lean on the, the chemistry and the testing that's been vetted by the EPA. But what we did, we spent three months and Michael developed cleaning protocols and then we would go in and test specific areas throughout the school to collect data. And what we were finding is there were tweaks that needed to be made. And what I've always told uh, anybody, and even in business or your personal life, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it, whether it's your budget, the calorie intake, and especially cleaning. Well, how do you measure something you can't see? And I always give the protocol or uh, the example, I was at a restaurant. And a lot of times we work hard at something only to not achieve the result that we thought we had achieved. So when uh, they set us down, they disinfected the surface and they worked hard at it. They wiped the surface off. We swabbed the surface and it was nowhere near hospital grade disinfection. Um, it was actually very high, but yet they just used a sanitizer disinfectant. So what Michael's put in place is to start off first with proper cleaning chemistry and then follow it up with disinfection. And then in some areas, there's a new technology on the market that uses Kytazan, 
And what that is, it's a coating that can be applied to surfaces that actually will dry. It's very safe and non-toxic. And it's been used by NASA. It's been used uh, by the University of Alabama to, to treat some of their equipment. Uh, it's been used by the military and in, in bandage care. But what it does, it gives ongoing persistent kill for bacteria, for viruses, for things of that nature. There's pros and cons to that. It's not something that's gonna do everything. Uh, but we've tested it. There's certain surfaces we think that it's gonna help keep the kids even safer. When you go back and look at the chemistries being used, and it, I guess if you watch anything right now, you're gonna see new cleaning technologies, new air purification systems, you name it. What we've really tried to do is start with what's safe and what's non-toxic and then go measure it and see if it works. So the protocol in place is actually, it's a, a, a botanical based cleaner and disinfectant. So it's very safe. The uh, SDS on it for the kids is gonna be very um, non-toxic even if they were exposed to it. The back shield, which is the actual chemical with the Kytazan, uh, once it dries down, it's extremely safe. So when you move through this process, we're hoping to take care of the kids that are in the space, but yet have protocols in place that yield a result that, that means we're getting the best cleaning and disinfection we can. Um, I will give you an example. <clears throat> I guess we've spent three months collecting data and we did the weight room. We did different handles and surfaces throughout the school. There was one area, we had to tweak some things on the front end to get the numbers we wanted. Those numbers I refer to are actually, they come from the hospital, because hospitals use ATP meters when they turn over a room. And what they're looking for is a, a, a number that's 50 or lower, they consider to be hospital grade disinfection. So that's what we were aiming at this summer. And we were able to achieve that on almost every surface but one. And so what it told us is that surface, when you looked at it, it looked clean, it looked sanitary. So it gave Michael the information he needed to manage that. So now he can change his protocols uh, to take care of that space. So we feel like it's a great program. Uh, it's certainly been, he's worked very hard at it. And when it comes to safety, the chemistries that are in place are, are, are exactly where they need to be. That is really cool to learn. I, I love that we tested and tried and, you know, went back. It's just it's the scientific model. So that's that I've learned something today. That was really cool. I didn't know all that was going on. I knew stuff was going on. I just didn't know the specifics. Um, I do want to ask a question of Anna because Anna, you have been at home, not physically in school, um, learning since last March when all this kind of went down, you know, right around spring break. So it's your senior year. Can you tell us a little bit about your thoughts about coming back to CAK in person for your senior year? And just kind of, I'm sure you have a lot of feelings on that. Mm -hmm. Well, um, I'm really excited and I hope we can go back and um, stay back just because it's so different to be at the school building and especially for a new year to meet your teachers, you know, um, and build that relationship. So I really hope we can go back um, and do all the normal senior year things. Me too. I really do. And that kind of leads us into a question for Mr. Fulford. Um, Rich, we've had a lot of folks asking us how we're going to decide how to move through these levels. We have four levels. If folks have not seen them in detail, you can go to cikwarriors.com. There's a pop-up. It'll take you right to them. But um, we've had folks say, you know, how are we going to decide to move through these levels. So I would like you to kind of speak to that. Well, even before I, I mentioned that, I just want to say that people ask me why I have so much confidence that we can come back in a safe and healthy environment. It's because of individuals like these folks on this, this uh, webinar tonight. You know, no one knows children any better than Janet McLean and Christian education. When she says, hey, students need, to, need the love and the touch and the relationship part, she's absolutely correct. And then when you hear the common sense and just the medical knowledge of, of Lynn and, and what he spoke into us today, uh, that was just having those people on the team that you can go to and ask their advice, ask their opinions, ask what the research says, that's just very, very valuable. And then I can't speak to everything that, that uh, Neil has shared with us as far as the science go. You guys 
I had a six minute video last week talking about this. If I tried to share the science, it would probably been 60 minutes. Um, of course, I don't know nearly what Neil does, but I feel very confident with, uh, with what we're doing. But, you know, this wasn't a process that, that happened overnight. Um, you know, I look back through my notes. Uh, once we started into the, uh, the online learning in March, we were thinking mostly, well, how about when we return to school? How can we return to school safely, uh, you know, in the first or second week of April? And then things started changing. It started uh, rapidly, you know, like Lynn said, don't ask me if what I said four months ago was accurate because you know, it's changed. And uh, so we were planning originally for a reopening of school last, you know, last quarter of the school year. But then I looked back through my notes and I saw on April 15th with our executive leadership team, uh, I shared an article uh, and I, I'm not sure where the article came from, but it was one of the, um, you know, Christian um, education, uh, ACSI organizations, with CC or something. And it said, you know, you need to start changing your thought. This, this is not going away. This is something that you need to start thinking about your reopening plans. So from April 15th, we started focusing and researching and trying to develop a plan where we could come back to school in August and keep our students safe and keep them healthy for a, a good return. And that plan has changed over time. You know, you have multi, um, multiple media outlets and, and most of us listen to the news and we hear that and then someone says this research and someone says that research and you're wondering who do I listen to? But ultimately it came down to, we have to listen to the people who do it every day for a living. And we've been very impressed with the help that the the Knox County Health Department has provided for us. Um, we decided that going through the health department and the CDC, listening to their guidance has been the most beneficial thing. So as heads of school, the other local heads of school in Knox County area, as well as people from um, Knox County Public Schools, we have been able to meet with the health department to just kind of narrow, funnel down all these ideas. So if you look at everyone's plans, a lot of the plans have have, have a lot of similarities. There are differences here and there, but mostly it's, it's, it's getting back to listening to the health department. And that takes me to the question that you asked me, how are we gonna move through the levels? Knox County Health Department, I've asked, well, what are the metrics? Um, you know, if you look at some of the surrounding counties or even across the state, some of the counties, their metrics may be 1% or of the population uh, has tested positive, so they wanna move. Knox County Health Department has not provided those metrics to the school system, nor any individual schools. And I, I haven't asked them specifically why, but I believe the reason is, is because we have so many small communities within the greater Knoxville area. And every small community has to look within at what their current situation is and use the information that they have to, to base, best make that decision. Now, if we were talking about snow day or absentee rates for uh, regular, not a snow day, but for flu or, or strep or something like that, we generally look at a 15% to 20% to absentee rate. Okay, well, this is an entirely different situation. You know, if I told parents we're going to go 15% or 20%, they would run me out of town. So if, if I'm thinking of it, I'm going to start thinking 1%. Okay, if we have 1% within our community, that is going to factor into the decision. But also, we're going to work with the health department because we have to make sure that we go with the, with the best guidance, the most current guidance, because Lynn said four months, the information may change. But what I'm finding is the information could change from in four days. So if we have a situation where it's, uh, we have, uh, let's say, a, a potential exposure, well, the first thing we're gonna do is have our medical coordinator reach out to the Knox County Health Department explain the situation thoroughly. Of course, we're gonna do an isolation. We're gonna call parents, have them come in. We're going to uh, make sure the area is, is clean with the protocols that, that uh, uh, certainly Neil has helped us put in place and helped Michael Westover, who is our director of facilities, put in place, uh, as well as our professional cleaning company that we contract with. But we're gonna take all those steps and then we're going to work with the health department to explain the situation and we're gonna use their guidance. Um, that's the best way I can say it. I'm not going to try and my staff is not going to try to beat the medical professionals at what they do. We have protocols, we have a plan, you know, we put out our, um, 
our family friendly plan, but there's a much, much more detailed plan that people like Lynn have gone over. Uh, Dr. Uh, Nichols have gone over and said, yeah, that's, that's a good, that's a good plan. And uh, it has, you know, our various levels, you know, of one, two, three, four, but we're going to start right there with level two. Um, and that is we are taking proactive measures to keep people safe. Uh, should the situation come where we have to move to the, uh, to a higher level, we'll communicate that with our families uh, after working with the health department to make those decisions. But it's not just me thinking, hey, okay, I think we need to do this. But we have a very, uh, you know, very detailed plan, but ultimately it's working with the medical professionals. Yeah, it is very, very detailed, even down to the building level and, you know, the times and where the students will go. I mean, it's very detailed. And, you know, we also wanted to build in a little bit of flexibility to that. That way we could loosen up our lockdown as needed by the health department as well. So I know that this is something that's very well thought out. One thing that I did want to touch on, um, Janet, I actually wanted to ask you this question. We have smaller class sizes at CAK um, than a lot of our local public schools. And I know that one thing that allows us to do is to properly social distance. But just as an educator, I would love to hear your thoughts on two things. Um, one, on the importance of the smaller class sizes, but also the importance of Christian education, because we're not just a, a private school or an independent school, we're a Christian school. And during this time, I know my faith has brought me through so much time of anxiety and just, you know, uncertainty. So just from a teacher's perspective, can you talk about the importance of those two things in a classroom with, with students? Well, having a smaller classroom is a bonus. It always was because with that, there's individualized instruction. You, you can, you can give, uh, children are able to, more openly discuss things and uh, when there are not as many children and also it can it's good for discipline and it, it can uh, it's better discipline when you've got a smaller classroom uh, but the, the, the best thing about a smaller classroom is knowing your children more intimately uh, and even if, if there are 90 children uh, you know say in a high school or a middle school going through your classrooms there's still uh there's an intimacy you want with them and uh that that i guess is the best thing that i that i felt with with my with my students uh was intimacy uh as far as uh christian education i i wanted that for my children from the very beginning uh because i wanted them to have what i had as a uh as a child in the 50s. Uh, I really, I remember being, uh, the Bible being read to us in class. I remember prayer in school and I remember a, a precious lady named Nell Davis that would come to my Chattanooga, Tennessee and teach Bible twice a week in the auditorium and put her flannel board up there for us to watch. And those were great memories and I wanted that for my children. So I'll throw uh, Christian school and uh, by the grace of God all of my grandchildren uh, are now in Christian school but the value I see in it and I see in a lot of our lungs as they come back a lot of a lot of them will say they remember verses in their darkest times I just heard a young man today my first hour the verses that I learned, the scripture that I learned, the memory verses I learned at CAK came back to me. And uh, nothing, nothing can trump hiding God's word in your heart because he is faithful to bring it back to us. We have the, um, we're able to pray with students at school, not just prayer requests in class, but many times I'd be able to, children would come to me with something to pray about and I could pray about with just an individual child. Even if there was a, discipline issue you could pray with them over that i would pray with children when they were when they weren't feeling well it's just the freedom in christ and i, I spoke this last night to the board to me one of our greatest the greatest purpose of CAK is to ignite passion and love for jesus christ into our students that we can do in our christian school it's very 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 true 
Um, I would love to hear Anna's perspective on that as well as a current student. Um, I'm sure Anna, last year, your junior year, when this pandemic rocked the world, I can't imagine what it was like as a student to go through that. I know for myself as an adult, it was stressful. So can you speak a little bit about going through that, your experience, but then also how Christian education helped you through that? Mm -hmm. um, so I think the teacher relationship was really important for me um, with all of my teachers because they each could, I was comfortable enough to reach out to them when I was struggling um, or just whatever I was going through because um, it was chaos. Um, and then also the teachers could reach out to us and ask us to help them as they adjusted to the new way of learning and everything. So I think being at a Christian school and having the smaller classes kind of helped with the freedom of communication. Um, and then also I'd say just the teachers walking through life with you um, was really cool to see how that happened um, during quarantine and stuff because the teachers were being affected um, in the same way. So we were all praying for each other. Um, so yeah, it was really cool to see. Um, I think it, I'm really glad I was at a small Christian school when that happened, um, just to see how everyone reacted. Yeah. Julia, I want to add also um, that what makes us special at CAK, I think, what sets us apart is the relationships between the, well, I mean, between everyone. I mean, our families uh, are sitting in the same stands or engaged in prayer together at at mom's prayer groups or dads are getting together for breakfast and it really becomes your life group. So it's, it's a great community. Um, but the students and the teacher relationship, that's, that's the big thing. It's very difficult to do that when you have humongous class sizes, you know, you can try, but really getting to know your students, being able to see, to look at them, look them in the eye and know something's going on with them and to be able to stop right there, in the middle of class or in the hallway or something say hey you know what Anna or, or whoever it might be hey what's going on can I pray with you because in this heightened heightened anxiety time because I'm sure some of our students are gonna gonna have loved ones who are struggling with with illness or um, you know they're gonna know somebody who's been impacted by this pandemic well there could be increased anxiety and being able to, to have that kind of relationship with your teacher where the, the teacher knows you and will pray with you and, and just uh, comfort you with the love of Christ, that's a very, very important thing that we're able to offer here at CAK. But, you know, science is one thing, but you know what? God gave us science, okay? He did. He's responsible for that. And he gave us good minds to make good decisions based on, uh, on, on what we have learned, what he's revealed to us. So, you know, we're going to use all those things, but ultimately we're going to serve him. We're going to follow his, you know, his, we're going to listen to his Holy Spirit with discernment and we're going to act how he, how he um, leads us. And uh, we're going to try to make the best decisions we can to keep people safe, but ultimately we're going to glorify him and uh, in all that we do. Amen. That, that is definitely the importance of our Christian school and our community as well. Well, I know we're coming up on, I think, about maybe a little over a half hour of our discussion here, and we've touched on many, many points. But I just wanted to give a moment to see if anyone had any pressing thing that you wanted to add before we close in prayer. Um, does anyone have anything? Yeah. Uh, Neil, were there any additional things about athletics from our day-to-day -day classroom, but also a lot of people are interested in sports. Yes. Great question. Um, Michael, and he actually saw this, we, we're using this technology of a persistent kill uh, chemistry that has Kytazan. It's actually been used for years by the University of Alabama. Uh, they had a, I guess, a staff or MRSA type of bacterial uh, control issues and most locker rooms do or did at one time. So this product was used to coat not only equipment, but jerseys, um, lockers, helmets. It's very safe and uh, Michael's in the process of getting that applied with steam to lock it into the equipment. We're going to see how long it will last on basketballs and soccer balls and volleyballs. I have my doubts there. It have to be reapplied frequently but at least there's something on there that's continuing to kill bacterial and viral and mold and mildew and, and everything else that, that it's intended to, to attack. 
It's not a perfect system, but it's certainly better than having nothing. And what I would add is in the world of disinfection we're in, most disinfectants only work while they're wet. So there's certain areas that Michael's identified that we really need this coating on there to try to protect it even longer uh, because it actually works when it's dry. So as you touch it or you deposit something on it, it's trying to kill it. Now the, the downside of that is it only works if it's clean. So now we're back to cleaning protocols. Now we're back to processes uh, to make that happen. So that's where you have to manage it with the ATP meter and making sure that your processes are staying in line. What I fully think will happen as everybody comes back, some of these areas are gonna to need to be tweaked. They're either gonna get used more or maybe less, but we just need to make sure that, that we're monitoring that and then we make adjustments as needed. Um, even the toy areas in elementary, um, this product can be applied to toys. You know, if they're touching them and putting them in their mouth, will it prevent everything? We don't know yet, but is it better than having nothing on there? Absolutely. So those are just some things that we're looking for for key spots to put it on and hopefully add some added protection, at least on the things that they touch. And then of course, as usual, parents, please help educate your kids not to touch their mouth, their eyes. It's hard to do. I've been sitting here scratching my chin most of the night, uh, but just keep them away from your nose, your eyes, your, your, and your mouth to where it could enter the body. It takes a village. It definitely takes a village. And we are so thankful for our warrior village. Um, well, if that is all, we are going to kind of close and wrap it up here. And we want to close and wrap it up as we always like to do at CAK, and that is with a word of prayer. So I'm going to ask Neil to close us out in prayer. Thank you. Our heads. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for this evening um, to have a conversation about not only the journey uh, from COVID hitting our school and our community and this nation and this world, but what we're preparing to do as we look forward in the coming days and the coming months, Lord, we pray for wisdom. We pray that everybody embrace their part as we move into this to make this not only an experience where hopefully we get to come back and participate in athletics and in classrooms and in the arts, but we participate because we're all doing our part and hopefully that helps to mitigate opportunities for this virus to spread. Uh, we especially pray for the, the opportunity for relationship. I mean, we are designed for relationship and that is just something Lord, we lift up to you and we just pray that you would provide that opportunity as we plan to enter and get back into this semester. Um, as we move forward, um, we we'll give all the grace or all the credit and glory to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you all so very much. Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Thank you, everyone. We appreciate you.